Hello everyone. Um, strap in because we're talking about the future of conflict, not just over the horizon, but above it. And before we get into that discussion, we have an engineer, a lawyer, and one just recently uh, retired military uh, space operator. Now, as we'll all get a chance to hear from all of them in just a minute, but first let's do a quick round of introductions. And why don't we start with you first? Great, so uh, Patrick Zaytuni, uh, I'd say recovering engineer, recovering consultant, <laughs> um, and now chief strategy officer at Hawkeye 360. Um, so uh, real quick, Hawkeye 360 is an RF uh, intelligence company from space, which we provide data as a service, um, both to the US government and our allied nations. Um, um, the chief strategy officer there, prior to that I was at uh, Blue Origin, um, with a variety of different roles there, uh, mostly in the advanced development programs. And like I said, uh, former consultant, McKinsey and & Company, and then uh, way prior to that actually did some engineering way back at the day of the Northrop. And our lawyer. Yeah, Laura, I, I did give Laura permission to, to reveal that I was a lawyer at one point. It's not good for I my branding, but I, I can't really hide from it. Uh, Rob Jekyll, I'm the CEO of Airbus US Space and Defense, which is part of Airbus, but I like to say a special part of Airbus because we operate under a special governance with the Department of, of Defense that allows us to do national security missions. We have military helicopters, fixed wing multi-mission aircraft, uh, unmanned aerial systems, and some command and control technologies. And finally, most importantly for this panel, a robust set of space systems technologies in the US, primarily in Florida and, and Texas, small sat manufacturing, laser comms, and space exploration. So that's Airbus US and me, the no longer lawyer, Rob Jekyll. <laughs> <laughs> and Pumper. Yeah. Hey. Hi uh, everyone, I'm Tom Nichols, uh, Chief Product Officer and, and co-founder of a company called True Anomaly. Um, my call sign is Pumper, which is a play on my last name, Nichols, so Pumper Nichols, uh, after the German bread. Um, and who gave you the name? Uh, yeah, it's it a very long story, but General Saltzman was involved in that, that naming <laughs> process, yeah. Um, so I was 11 years active duty military, nine in the Air Force and two in the Space Force. Uh, some notable assignments, all of that was a Space Operations Officer. Uh, did some mil satcom, but um, I went to the Air Force Weapons School in 2015, which is where I got my call sign. Uh, I spent a year in Qatar in the Middle East working in the Combined Air Operations Center. Um, and then I uh, spent three years teaching at the Weapons School in Las Vegas. Um, during that time, I, I was part of standing up what is called the Orbital Warfare Curriculum for the Space Force. Um, and then uh, my last assignment in the military was at the National Space Defense Center, the NSDC, in Colorado Springs. Um, and now at True Anomaly, which is uh, a company we started to, to help support a, a secure, safe, and sustainable space domain. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to be here. Now, we're not gonna really wax poetic uh, about how supposedly space was benign in the past, because in 1955, the Air Force issued General Operational Requirement 96, which called for a ballistic missile detection system. And in June 1958, the Air Force issued General Operational Requirement 170 for a satellite defense system. And then um, in 1959, NORAD officials advocated for a space order of battle. So here we are, 64 years later, and you don't even need to be a spacefaring nation to combine Earth observation products with space-supported command, control, and communication tools. You know, that's the story of Ukraine and its geographic information system for artillery. It's called GIS Arda, and it's an Android app that works much like the driver's side of Uber, except it shows targets, not fares. So not only do we know that satellites are shaping how modern conflict is prosecuted to retain the edge, you know, that ability to make, transmit, you know, make informed decisions faster, more securely. You three are in the thick of it. You know, what demand signals for your businesses are you receiving? And how have these demand signals shaped your business decisions this year? And Rob, I want you to start this off. Yeah, sure, thanks, Laura. And I, and I love the concept of demand signals because this is the, the raison d'etre for Airbus US is to marry up a demand signal with a discriminating technology 
and then industrialize in the U.S. and Americanize it. And um, we have a lot of space uh, assets and technology, so there's a lot of opportunities. But if you're talking about Air in the U.S. and Airbus U.S., the, the box office hit from a demand signal standpoint for us and where we are in the value chain is SDAs, space development agencies, proliferated warfighter space architecture. So this is a really transformational way of acquiring constellations for the U.S. government. If you look at it from a historical standpoint, uh, you would buy a satellite in geosynchronous orbit, spend billions of dollars for it, and it would take over 10 years to acquire that capability. And, and those will still exist. But what SDA is doing is having a proliferated, disaggregated constellation in low Earth orbit where you're replenishing these satellites and upgrading them every two years at a cost point that is radically worth cheaper. I mean, you just look at the SDA's publicly available budget information and say, you know, 14 to 25 million per copy. So a radical change. Um, and that constellation is going to serve as the backbone for joint all domain command and control, this mesh network of moving massive amounts of information at sensor and shooter late latency, which requires a laser communications. And, where Airbus US uh, fits into that, when we, when we see those demand signals, we have a proud heritage of mass production of constellations. So we've, we've delivered already with our partner OneWeb over 600 commercial constellations in a low Earth orbit. And so we're able to leverage that scale and invest to increase our, our factory area output, our engineering capabilities to modify and adapt and improve that technology so that it can withstand the requirements of national security customer. And we're, we're investing, I won't go into specific numbers, but hundreds of millions of dollars to design uh, products, uh, modular satellite capabilities, and improve our factories, increase our factories. And then on the comm side, so that's manufacturing, high speed manufacturing at scale, something that Airbus is really good at. And then on the other side is the laser comm piece, laser communications in terms of moving lots of amount of information, very difficult to, to jam, so good in contested environments, and necessary, a necessary piece of the puzzle if you're going to have a mesh network across all domains. And we happen to have some discriminating technologies, uh, notably our, our TASAT set of laser comms. So we're building those in Florida as well. So we're marrying up those demand signals with dollars, investments, and bringing the technologies to the United States. And Patrick? Yeah, I was going to add, you know, on the commercial remote sensing side of, uh, of the market, um, if, if you look at the tensions uh, with China, the continuing conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa, the, the Ukraine conflict, um, what it's done is send sort of reverberations throughout commercial uh, remote sensing. You know, it took imagery 10 years to get from where you know, it's, it's nascent start through you know, now a, a very robust contract with, uh, with the NRO. And uh, these conflicts have dramatically accelerated both the adoption of imagery but also the other phenomenologies, you know, radio frequency like ourselves, uh, synthetic aperture radar, hyperspectral, thermal, all of these things, uh, you know, we're even repurposing uh, you know, wildfire satellites to detect artillery, uh, uh, both firing and, uh, and, and, and impacts, which is just sort of mind-blowing. And um, so what we're seeing is you know, dramatic increase in adoption, both by you know, countries that never you know, flew anything into space, and now they have a you know, world-class uh, space capability being able to you know, procure it as a service, essentially. Uh, so what that has driven for us is a uh, you know, significant increase in demand in capacity. So being able to um, you, you know, focus a lot of that on the sort of the hotspot areas. Uh, capabilities as well. Um, you, you know, whatever you provided last year is not good enough and it needs to get better. And the other thing we're hearing over and over is you know, more analytics, more knowledge. So don't just give me the raw pixels uh, or the raw SAR or the, you know, just the dots on a map. Tell me what these things are. Tell me uh, what I can do about them, who they are, what they're doing. And so the more we can actually provide knowledge and insights and actually therefore make it much more usable for the end user, I think that's going to go a long way in satiating some of that demand and, and unlocking new use cases. And Pumper. Yeah, I, I think the, the demand signal, I, we've seen it for a while, and that's really the, the reason we started this company. Um, my co-founders and I saw that when we were active duty, um, which is kind of the foundation for what we're doing. I think most recently the demand signals we've seen are, uh, just for a few examples, the stand-up of the 75th Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance Squadron yep. um, and their mission set 
by the way, really good commander, uh, great guy leading that organization. Um, I think General Shaw's comments about spacecraft and maneuverability are another demand signal. Um, the tactically responsive space mission set coming out of Space Safari um, and SSC, uh, as well as the range and, and the Starcom responsibilities for providing a, an operational test and training infrastructure. I think we saw those signals and said, I, we can go out and start this company and, and help provide the kit necessary for those missions. And so that's kind of uh, the demand signal you're describing are, are the foundation for what we're doing at True Anomaly. Now in terms of national security and space, what do you think are the current key drivers for transformation, for iteration, you know, especially in your particular verticals? You know, what challenges are you getting after? And Patrick, why don't you start? Yeah, I think, um, and it's not just remote sensing, but I think fundamental to a lot of space transformation, I think there's three things. Uh, first one is the hardware itself. Uh, what you're able to do with something that is, let's say, 30, 40 kilograms, you know, would have taken, a thousand kilograms, five thousand kilograms spacecraft to do before. Now, uh, I mean, we were just talking earlier. You, you, you guys went from you know four four guys in a in a in a WeWork to actually you know mostly building a spacecraft in less than a year. Right? That, that would have been impossible uh, just even a few years ago. So the ability of these small sats and, and and this hardware to be put together much more cheaply and 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 rapidly is is, is a huge innovation. The second one is, uh, and this is probably you know, more so on the on the remote sensing, is um, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and cloud computing. So now all of a sudden, it doesn't take a nation state level of capability and server farms to do some of these uh, missions. Uh, you, you know, you're able to use uh, AWS, Azure, et cetera, to really you know scale compute, be able to do phenomenal things there, and use AI to train on certain data sets you just would not be able to do before. So now you can provide incredible levels of insight with just small teams of folks and you know, not having to build out you know huge amounts of infrastructure. And I think the third piece is um, private capital coming into space. So. Uh, you know, a lot of these things are actually being funded by, you know, billionaires, but also, uh, uh, you know, venture capital, uh, institutional investors that have come in into the space. And, uh, you know, my favorite quote of all time um, from the right stuff, no bucks, no Buck Rogers. So without that money to sort of go invest ahead of need, uh, you know, we wouldn't see this, this innovation. And, um, and so I think the three of these converging together has been very interesting. And Bumper, what are you seeing? Yeah, I, I think, um, as I mentioned, kind of the demand signals. Um, the reason those, I think, are demand signals is because there's there's not solutions or perfect solutions or, or you know, uh, enough right now for what the government or industry is looking for. Um, and so we are, are kind of focused on two primary efforts, which is space domain awareness um, and then supporting the Space Force's operational test and training infrastructure, a space range. Um, to do that, we've, we've built our first two spacecraft that we, um, yeah, we started in May of last year on a whiteboard and are, are launching this uh, February on Transporter 10. Um, our first two satellites called Jackal. Uh, they're highly maneuverable uh, with a suite of sensors that take pictures and full motion video. Um, they have a lot of use cases for space domain awareness, for understanding what's happening in the domain, but can also support test, training, and range um, that, that the Space Force is looking for. Um, coupled with that, we're building a lot of, of software. It's obviously the, the flight software that goes on the spacecraft vehicle. Uh, there's software, ground software to actually command the vehicle itself, but also a suite of training applications um, and battle management features uh, to support uh, national security. Yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably break this into three elements for, when I look at the drivers and transformation and iterative innovation. The first is going to sound pedestrian, but it's execute. I mean, you, we have a transformation in front of us in terms of satellite manufacturing in the national security space, and it's the pedestrian blocking, untackling of scaling, executing on cost, on quality, on schedule. Um, Second, when I look at sort of the next iterations of spiral development, um, tech refresh, because Airbus has a lot of technologies, we look, oh, how can we move into that value chain? Is it synthetic aper aperture radar payloads, earth observation, uh, software, or systems architecture? And so when we pulse the community of engineers and CTOs, those are elements that we're thinking of. And then the third, uh, in terms of innovation, is how can we 
position our whole portfolio of products in space and national security. We have platforms, we have communications technologies. How do we fit our platforms into this space net, uh, mesh network in terms of value proposition? So that's sort of how I look at this, um, you know, in terms of near term, mid term, and then looking at the entire Airbus group in space and national security space. Now you three bring a lot of value to your customers and that value is not secret. And it's also the envy of adversaries. They know U.S. defense and our deterrence proposition depends on the key products and services you provide. There's a lot going on in the gray zone, such as lasing, jamming, cyber, and in the red zone, both China and Russia have declared that you know, commercial players are fair targets because you support you know, a lot of their adversaries. So in your opinion, you know, what should be the priorities for protecting satellites? What are the technologies needed? And are you working on these? And Pumper, you yeah. should definitely start there. Yeah, ab <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, I think what kind of describes it best is, is uh, General Saltzman's theory of success that he, that he um, you know, talked about. Explain that a bit. Yeah, and, and um, the, one of the, the first line of effort in there is avoiding operational surprise. Mm. And in, in order to effectively avoid operational surprise, you need very high fidelity domain awareness of what's occurring. Um, and so uh, we see that theory of success, we see that line of effort, and um, that's what our Jackal spacecraft is designed to support. So understanding what adversaries are building, what they're capable of, that's the first step. And so the foundation of deterrence and security in space is space domain awareness, understanding what's happening in the domain. Um, and so, yeah, our, our spacecraft are focused on that mission. Um, I mentioned the two that we're launching in February. We, we plan to launch uh, dozens of those over the next few years for this exact mission, um, which very much supports the foundation of, of space defense and deterrence. I think for, for us as, at, at Hawkeye, I think, um, and we're very committed to the national security uh, mission, you know, I think the law of large numbers is in our favor. And so um, we want to turn the equation around where the more we can uh, put these up in different places and, and actually do them at very efficient um, uh, you know, economics, um, I, I think we can actually flip it around where it's, it's, it's significantly more expensive to impact our constellation than, than to do otherwise. Um, I do worry about things like cyber, because that's that are ways where you can just take out entire entire systems. And so I think that's one place where the US government can help, which is um, you know work with industry to help harden some of the key aspects. And, and you know we're never going to be as good as they are. So getting to learn some of that and implement it, I think would be you know great for us. Um, I think the other the other side of it is um, uh, maybe a little bit more administrative, but it, it is almost as important is um, uh, you know business insurance does not cover nation states attacking you and um, and, and so in, in acts of war um, you know the, the commercial companies are the ones liable for for the assets so uh, having some ability to you know, have some coverage by the US government to step in you know in, in the course of war I think would be advantageous uh, the other one which is companies that uh, uh, provide uh, data as a service um, you know unlike the defense prime that just sell hardware that are given full indemnification, uh, we, we, we do not have that. And so that's another thing that sort of you know, would keep me up a little bit is in the course of conduct of, of you know, in, in some of these you know, future activities, let's say you know, something happens and you know, somebody uh, you know, sues a, a commercial provider for uh, you know, providing some piece of data that, that resulted in something. And so having some form of indemnification uh, you know, to actually help protect commercial companies uh, would be huge. Otherwise, the lawyers would just go absolutely crazy <laughs> with that. And, and, uh, and, and, How come and, you're uh, talking about litigation? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't have much, to, I completely agree, you know, prolifer proliferation is in and of itself, if it's cost effective, is a deterrent, right? If you can only take out a, a certain portion of the constellation and capacity and it costs more to do that than it does for us to replace it, that's a deterrence in and of itself. Um, so I agree, and, and, and Pumper, is, you're clearly the resident rock star in terms of on-orbit security. The only thing I would add is, um, again, pedestrian issue of supply chain assurance, right? It ties into cybersecurity, but if you're
relying on proliferation, you also have to have cyber and supply chain uh, locked down and the other elements, maneuverability, and I think there's gonna be an enhanced maneuverability. There's already some capabilities that are being launched in terms of um, protecting from directed energy attacks and, and the other things that the engineers will, will tell me that we're working on is you know, systems architecture. How can you segment the systems architecture so if part of it is degraded, you can shut that down and still have capacity and capability uh, within the satellite. So those are the themes, but you know, again, to defer to my colleagues really on, on these topics as uh, in terms of on-orbit security and, and, and those topics. No. So let's think about a future that may not actually be that far off. You know, and that's the cislunar region, that's the moon. You know, activities and national interests there are growing exponentially. You know, just last week, Japan launched a, a lander, right? And then before that, we had India, then Russia. Well, Russia didn't make it, it crashed. But, you know, it, it, there's a lot of stuff going on. We've got intuitive machines, and they're going to launch in November. So things are really ramping up there. So I kind of want to know, you know, what commercial services or technologies do you think the Department of Defense is going to need in the cislunar region in the, on the moon because wherever commerce goes, you know, defense defense goes too. Um, I would say there are uh, again being former consultant, everything is in threes. So there are three <laughs> things uh, that are absolutely needed. Um, you know, one is first of all, you know, uh, transportation out there. Uh, if, if you're not actually out there, you, 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 know, you don't get a say in things, right? So uh, NASA's done some wonderful things with uh, you know, the CLIPS program and, and providing as a service. I think on the national security side, we, we need to be thinking about how, you know, what, is, what is the national security transportation uh, system? Uh, and, and again, relying as much as possible on commercial, that enables us to do more, not just in cislunar, but I would say ex-geo broadly. The second thing is uh, mobility, um, not just getting there, but actually being able to move around. Uh, the funny parts of you know that, that the area with low gravity is you can do some pretty amazing things, and with three, uh, three body dynamics, Keplerian orbits don't matter. So, so it becomes very interesting what you can do there. So, it brings me to the third piece, which is space domain awareness. There, it becomes even more critical to understand what is going out there, and now you're dealing with you know thousands of kilometers and, and, and so really having a way to have used new phenomenology to actually understand what's going out there on the lunar surface, around the moon, on the backside of the moon, all of that is gonna be super important, not just for security of that region, but even protecting the geosphere from things kind of coming back and doing stuff. So um, I, I think it's absolutely critical, but we gotta focus on putting these three pieces of infrastructure before we could do anything there, otherwise we don't get a voice. And Rob, I mean, I would imagine that you would be thinking about secure and, and, and fast, you know, communications. Mm -hmm. Because those decisions have to be made quickly, but still it takes time for signals to get from there to here. I mean, what are you guys looking at? Yeah, well, I, I, I discussed a little bit earlier the, the laser comm solution, which is, which is a piece of the puzzle, a puzzle in terms of communications. When you look at cislunar and space exploration, we're pretty active in, in this area. We're, we're working on the European service module for the Orion mission. Um, we just announced a joint venture with Voyager to have a commercial international space station. And, and to your point, you're gonna have more people and missions in space, in cislunar space, that means the need for logistics, for communications, uh, as, as you say, maybe uh, you know, manufacturing, um, repairs, all of these things are gonna create an ecosystem where there will be a lot of money, a lot of required investments, and I think there will need to be a partnership between government and commercial to satisfy those, those, those uh, gaps. Um, and Pumper, we're running out of time, yeah, but I, I want you well, to get yeah. in on this. Um, I just echo what Patrick said, and maybe this this the tagline, but wherever humans are going in space, there will need to be space domain awareness. And so, uh, Cislunar is not an exception to that. Yeah. And are you guys as true anomaly looking at Cislunar at all? Absolutely, absolutely. The demand signals are there that you you've mentioned, and um, so it's definitely on our roadmap. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you to the audience for listening to us discuss you know, warfare, modern warfare, and space. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.